on this week's episode of the Auto House Podcast. I think Jeff was in the passenger seat like, oh, it's leaking in here. I was like, what do you mean it's leaking in here? And I saw it. I was like, God damn it. This is the Auto House Podcast. Steven, what's up, man? When's the last time you were on the podcast? I think last year. I think it's been, I think it was the end of last year, I believe. I'm not sure. 100%. It's been a while. Yeah. So since last year, you're officially, I guess the big thing now is you're officially a Battle Garage employee. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't really talk to, I don't have a lot of car friends or talk. I try not to tell people that I am. Mm -hmm. So there's like, some people know. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Cool. How's your car going? Um, the AC is great. I'm trying to get it like more of a daily driver. Well, now that AC in, so I'm trying to get all the suspension in. Yeah, and just it's on Jackson right now, but it's getting somewhere for once. Cool. So one of the reasons I wanted to do this episode is kind of do a recap on the whole Vintage Air project and then where we're at right now. So why don't we talk about where the project is right now from your point of view? Uh, right now it's. It works like very surprisingly. There's cold air coming out of my vents, so I'm very like happy about that. I think the next plans will probably be try to fix up some. I think a little bit of airflow and try changing my defrost because it's going to the passenger side, which I don't need. I need to have it on the driver's side so I can see like during the like when I start up my car and during the night. Yeah, I forgot which episode on YouTube or which part it was, but right after I rewatched it, I saw the mistake I made was um, I actually didn't need to space out that adapter, that square adapter vent, the Ford F100 one. I actually needed to put it up so the other two side vents got blocked off because we, because you know it's like a three-part in that defrost. Yeah, so it goes from... And we deleted the the end two vents. Yeah. So, so yeah, I made a mistake. We should have not spaced it up. And then, yeah, next time the car comes in, I think I'll try to play with where to put that adapter so that it blows the defrost air evenly across the driver and the passenger side. Yeah, all part of learning. I mean, <laughs> like when it like the only we're like the only ones documenting it, so we're like the first. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Even even like all the stuff I've seen on YouTube, like all the muscle car stuff, because majority of that is uh, the vintage air Surefit kits, so it's like made for that car. No, it's. Like almost no one is doing the stuff we're doing where it's like, well, I guess it'll work. So why don't we try and, or we have to modify stuff to make it work or, you know, you went on a few trips to Lowe's with me. So yeah, I'm just like trying, <laughs> testing out like pipes and seeing if, how to connect them and stuff like that. Buying a lot of, a lot of, not back and forth, but buying stuff because we need more items from like vintage air, yeah, random stuff from Lowe's. Yeah, it's good that you're stress testing it because there's a lot of stuff that you find out afterwards by physically using the product so one thing i remember is the controls don't light up at night so that's pretty important and yeah. we didn't i didn't realize that yeah that one that one depends on which uh controls you buy because uh like eric teddy i think he bought the another type where it does light up like a, a slimmer edition yeah, but we just got the basic one, so it doesn't light up. So when I tur first time turned on my car at night, I was like, huh, everything's super dark. Because my radio wasn't working either, so it was just like pitch black. Yeah. Yeah, and that's important because on the vintage air controls, it's not just like an AC button. It's actually pretty specific, the instructions for adjusting like AC and heat. Yeah. And then like even uh, for AC, it's like at a certain position. It's not just like one button for AC. Yeah. And I, I know I remember the reading the instructions. So you can't turn it way too much. Or oh, yeah. you might like, like blow it or not blow it, but like you might. It's a freeze. Yeah, freeze. Yeah, freeze. And yeah. then um, if you guys watch part six on YouTube, we actually froze the evaporator. Mm. Do you remember that? Yeah, I did. Because uh, it's because was it the the switch wasn't wired correctly, right? Was that yeah. the reason? Yeah. yeah, I didn't wire the switch correctly the first time. And so the AC compressor clutch was stuck on the whole time. And then the symptom was that water was coming out of the feet vents inside the cabin. Yeah. yeah. 
It was like leaking just a little bit. I think Jeff was in the passenger seat like, oh, it's leaking in here. I was like, what do you mean it's leaking in here? And I saw it. I was like, God damn it. Thank God, though. I think we wouldn't have noticed it. It wasn't for Jeff, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So w- right now, where else are we at with the kit? I think next we are trying to shorten the hoses a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah, because it's l- way too long. So we bought an adapter for it. I think that's next. Yeah, so uh, we had our first Friday slash 8-6 day celebration a couple days ago. It's Sunday today. And Bad Boy was really curious, asking me about the whole vintage air setup. And one key question he had for me was the amount of airflow that we get compared to the OEM HVAC. And it's, yeah, from what he said, it's hard to find the CFM rating per each unit because, you know, there's like a Gen 2 Mini, Gen 2 Compact, like Gen 5 Magnum or Gen 4 Magnum. And, uh, but I said the, for us, like just feeling it, the comparison is not really fair because our hose routing isn't really finalized yet. So yeah, talk about, cause I mean, you were here for majority of it and like you, you see it. So talk about the hose routing for the air vents we have in the car right now. It's like all over the place because it's kind of weird because we use, we're using OEM, like, like plastic material, like the center, the center piece that goes into the two main vents in the middle, we're reusing that. So our hoses aren't like directly into the vents because if it was directly into the vents, you most likely get more airflow instead of depleting into like other spaces. So this is like one of our issues. Yeah, you're exactly right. So I think even Vintage Air says it too. You want those hoses as short and as direct as possible. But that's difficult for us because I know I keep saying it over and over. I only need two outlets out of that Gen 2 mini unit, but we have five. So, I mean, right now there's five hoses like crammed in there, snaked all around. But uh, like in the interim, we have those two 180 degree adapters that uh, when, when we have time, we'll bring your car back in. And that should improve airflow because on those last two vents, the those hoses are like snaked all around. Yeah. That's why we can't install your, that's why we cannot install your uh, glove box right now. Yeah. I can't passenger seats because I'm scared of them like kicking it or like kicking anything just in case. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So why don't we go through the whole process like from from start to where we're at now? I know, I know it's going to be like a long journey, but. We can we can give like some some cliff notes or like some key things we found or some key headaches for us. So let's start from the beginning. So yeah. so why why did you want AC in the first place? California is hot as hell. <laughs> and then you were going to take it upon yourself to install AC. What did you try to do or what did you buy? Uh, I bought a manual steering rack AC compressor bracket from Jacob, but I never used it because I realized I had to find all the other parts. And then I didn't even realize my car never came with AC in the first place. As I realized I have like an AC delete duct. Yeah, or the guy who, one of the previous owners of your car, like forcefully took all the AC stuff out. So there used to be an evaporator core in there, but at one point somebody took it out and put the AC delete duct. Yep, and then it's like, it's a mix of like, I need to find all the lines if I want to do OEM or just have to recreate it myself. But I, and I'm a little too new to that. So I'm like, where should I start? It's like another issue for me. Yeah. Well, so so am I. I mean, this was yeah. this AC, this making AC from scratch was all new to me too. So, did you know about the vintage air setup before we did this? I did. I think I saw an Instagram post by someone else with an eight six who had it too. Or like I or like I would look up about AC and people would recommend like oh vintage air because like hot rod people use it or like it's very. Like Jay Leno used it, and I think some of his cars, or most of his cars, is it vintage? I air? think most of his yeah, cars of have cars, vintage yeah. air in it. Yeah, so it was like it was just like a recommendation. If you look it up, Club Four AG, someone mentioned it, or like some other forums mentioned it. So I decided, oh, okay, why? Maybe I should try this. Yeah. So shout out to Eric Teddy. I mean, totally the catalyst for, I guess, both of us to want to take on this project. I forget the exact reason. I said yes. Can you remember what like got us excited about the project for us to like, why don't we start? I started by sending an email and then making a phone call. But I mean, before that, what do you think was the, like the catalyst to like, why don't we start? This is exciting. Ooh, I, mean, I don't remember. It's been like two months. Yeah. Probably like three, like two and a half months. So it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was just like, I've been wanting AC for a while. And when Eric got it, I think during a podcast, probably. Or like you're talking to him about it. Yeah. Or some post 
maybe posted the Instagram post, and from there it's like, it's possible. Maybe we should try it. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing for me was that he sent me pictures of his setup and sent me the receipt with the parts list, and like actually seeing it in a picture, I was like, okay, it's possible. Like I didn't say like okay I can do it yet. It's just, I for me it was just like okay it's not impossible. It's a challenge. It's a project to take yeah. up. I guess from that point it was just kind of like a leap of faith. Like well shit I guess we'll try. Yeah. I'm like once yeah. we bought the parts it's like okay it's happening. <laughs> yeah. And I think step by step I got more confidence. Like talking to Roy the sales rep um, and finding out he was super knowledgeable and like really nice, really professional. That was like one confidence builder talking to the national sales rep and him helping us get a account so that we're an official vintage air distributor. That was another like vote of confidence. And then, I mean, that was really confident for me to, you know, put down that money, large amount of money, straight up $4,000 initial buy-in to be a uh, vintage air dealer. And I remember getting the parts and I was like, well, shit, here we are. (laughs) I was like, oh no, here it begins. Yeah, do you remember that day when we got all the parts? We yeah. didn't get everything at once. I remember that, but uh, we got a lot of boxes at once. Yeah, I was like, I was the one who brought them in. So I was like, yes, ooh, it's happening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, one exciting thing too, I know like during the process was like slowly you could see like boxes, one box after another like disappearing because we were making more progress. And then we were down to that one long box for a long time. And then finally, I consolidated it to one small box. And I remember one day I was like, Stephen, look, this is all we have left. <laughs> it's only a single hose and like some plastic pieces. And yeah. we're, we're there. Talk about the process in between. like, Because, I mean, we work in the same building. So while I was doing it on your car, thanks again for volunteering your car, by the way. And so during the process, when I was doing R&D and installing it on your car, were there any like standout moments, any moments that worried you? Not really. I mean, I trust you a lot of things. So, I mean. You put too much trust in me. I mean, a... <laughs> I mean, you built, you're the only one who knows how to build transmissions. So transmissions I, different than air conditioning. Yeah, I know, but it's somewhere. <laughs> it's somewhere. I don't know. Just like, why not? <laughs> I mean, you, you really knowledge already and I really bring my car to you for other help. So I'm like, I, if it goes down, I have another car. It's okay. I could, we'll figure it out. So that's one benefit is that you were able to leave this car because you had another daily driver, which is probably Corolla golden rule number one at this point is like, don't daily drive your Corolla. I'm about to break that rule. (laughs) (laughs) Let's see. What were some moments that worried me? What were some moments that worried me? Figuring out the air duct routing still worries me right now because Remember at first, like video, the part one where we took out all the HVAC stuff and did a weight measurement and we're like, there's plenty of room in here. And then slowly as stuff got added in, we're like, we're running out of room very yeah. fast. I was like, because it looked like we took out a lot, but in reality, like all the hosing takes up a lot of space and yeah. all the like lines because it's really weirdly routed because it has to make like a U-turn, right? Or like a different direction yeah. into the vent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What were some other things that worried me? I have a lot of experience with hydraulics. So like power steering, brakes, hydraulic suspension. So, and then making AC lines, making any crimp lines in general is pretty new for me. Like AC lines in particular are completely brand new for me. So I was really worried, like, are any of these lines going to leak? Oh, yeah. Because like... It's not that easy, right? Like if a brake line leaks, it's like not not a big deal. We'll close it back up. But AC, that's a big deal. Like recover the refrigerant. Um, it's under high pressure. Uh, Freon's actually dangerous, right? Like it can, like the name says, it can freeze you. So yeah, if an AC line leaks, it's not like, oh, okay, that's not a big deal. Yeah, it's it's not- like, oh, it's an oh shit moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it, thank God Vintage Air has like a hydro, like the crimp tool that was pretty cool and like it was pretty easy for the parts they sent us in my opinion like just to do all the lines yeah i I had a fun time using the hydro crimp tool like it was straightforward to use it worked every time it was like i don't know it was fun to use yeah and you could probably use for other things too oh yeah yeah exactly so you can use that hydro crimp tool actually for more than just ac hose because it does regular hose and then i think it's called a 
reduced barrier hoses, the AC hose we're using. So for example, if you had like power steering line or like some other hydraulic line, that hydro crimp tool is, uh, can also be used for that also in the future. Yeah. I think it's a good investment because you don't have to like put it up to a vice and then, oh, take out, take out the line and then put it back in again to remeasure. So that's, that's important because yeah, yeah. we crimped a lot of the fittings in the car because there was stuff like the firewall grommets where like, I don't want to take this hose yeah, back yeah. out. Dude, just, just putting it through was tough already. Like, I'd help you do that too. Oh, yeah. 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 What were some other challenges we had with this kit? Idle up. Oh, that was shit. a long talk. Well, uh, still we're um we're still like idle ups not ready for the production version yet because we don't have the right like idle up VSV. So why don't you talk about the idle up? Um, I I think that's a big issue that comes with it because there's not a lot of information on it. I'm not too knowledgeable about that because I'm not even sure how it works. I know it's just about pressure and depending on how much pressure comes in, it turns up the, the idle. But then. Other than that, I realized that there's not there's not a lot of information about it. I re- I did a lot of looking through the manuals for the wiring about it. Everything runs off the the. There's probably like an AC control module. Yes, yes that yeah. it literally runs all the AC. And when you take it out, it's like okay, how does how does the idle up work now? Because now that's controlling it. So it was like try and figure that out. N- now that we put like RPM switches, like how do we wire that up? Or how do we wire even wire up the idle air in general? Yeah, yeah. So how did we wire up the RPM switch in tandem with the idle up valve? So before we talk about that, why don't we talk about the RPM switch? Because there's two things you brought up that were like key moments for me. Was you said basically like how do we do idle up because I want it, and then the RPM switch was a big deal also. So why don't we talk about the RPM switch? Yeah. Uh. So for the RPM switch, uh, I was looking up. A, I was looking up vintage air, and then I looked up something about the idle up, and it came up a post or a website about. I forgot what type of cars there are, but like. I think you said Mustangs. Yeah, Mustangs yeah. or like American cars who, who had like, putting in vintage air into their cars, and they ran into a problem. It was like a race team who did do that, or not a racing but a team, but they did it and they blew compressors as they got close to that range. And I didn't even know that our compressor has like a 6K limit or like it doesn't go over that. Or if you, if you do, you might just blow it. Yeah, so the Sandin compressor we're using has is rated for a 6,000 RPM sustained limit. But I think you were saying before that these guys would run compressors and then they would just fail constantly and they wouldn't know why. So, you know, even though they have, the upper limit is 6,000, but I mean, if you run it at the upper limit the whole time, it's, uh, I bet you it significantly shortens the lifespan of that compressor, so. Yeah, uh, I think the post even said they weren't even running it that high or like they were like getting close, like not even fairly close and it would still blow. Like it would just still fail on them. So then you told me the solution for them was an RPM switch. So what is an RPM switch? RPM switch is just a really easy like on-off module. So once your RPM hits like a limit that you set, it just turns off the whatever you wire it into. So So most common RPM switch is used for nitrous. So people like, let's say, for example, at 7,000, it'll turn on their nitrous. But in this application, what do we say for 5,000? Yeah, we said 5,000. So we set it for that at 5,000 RPM, it cuts power from the AC compressor clutch. So at 5,000, the AC compressor in s- itself won't be on. So it, it'll that's like a safeguard to prevent damage. Yeah. And then thank you, Koji Mori is the one who drew us that electrical diagram so that we could run a... RPM switch and idle up valve in tandem so that when the AC compressor clutch is on, the idle air idle up valve is also on. The genius himself. Yeah. So one thing I feel like is still a big challenge was the AC compressor bracket itself. Because I think we talked about it over and over. It took me one week, one working week just to make the AC compressor bracket. I mean, it's very different because our bracket is just like, oh, it, it just fits in and that's it. It just holds it up because our bracket, we, we want to have it also set up with um, 
power steering. Yeah, power steering. So it's it was like a dual application. Yeah, so that's what made it took it even longer, doing all the math for it, and just uh, and just for you just fabricating it itself took a long time. Yeah. yeah. So there's a couple factors. I wanted it so that if you wanted this vintage air setup, you could still keep your power steering. I didn't want you to have to make that compromise. And then the other thing too was, I basically made this bracket out of their fabricators kit which is basically some universal mounts for the ac compressor and then i went to lowe's and bought like a square piece of steel so i pretty much made this thing from entirely scratch yeah it was like a lot of welding the building smelled <laughs> just the usual <laughs> yeah 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 i made a lot of cuts and then when we were about to put the ac compressor again i made one more cut and one more weld so but yeah the because the, the thing was um, belt alignment has to be correct. So you're going to need a two row pulley with this. So if you can imagine front and back and then like the angle up and down of the compressor and then also side to side. So all those together, no wonder it took one whole week. Plus all the, not to mention all the time, like cut, fit, cut again, fit again, weld a little more. Measure, you know, measure, put in the belt. Measure, test measure, it. measure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Make sure it even like it was running straight because that's the biggest problem. You don't want to be like ripping belts. Yeah. I think that was one big day for us was that when we had the AC compressor bolted up, no lines, just bolted up with the brackets of the block and we ran the engine and like the belt was good. Yeah. I think that was like one big breakthrough for us. I was like, yes, we're like, this is a big deal. We're making progress. Yeah, we're like, that's literally like, the biggest part because that bracket is like the hardest thing in my opinion or like one of the hardest parts because these are fully fabricated from scratch yeah from scratch yeah. yeah what was another big breakthrough moment for us for me it was uh once i had the gen 2 mini unit in the car and i had it wired up enough so that it worked oh like, yeah like once air started blowing out of the unit like no vents no nothing just once the unit started blowing out air and I could control the blend door. Like that was exciting just just as is. Yeah, it's like it's on, it's working. Yeah. Now it just needs cold air. <laughs> yeah. Totally no lie. If you want to install this unit or for people who want to restore the HVAC system in your Corolla, everything's got to come out. Like the dash, the almost like the safety beam, the, oh, yeah. the, the crash bar, all that's got to come out because all the foam in there is probably all deteriorated by now and then you saw because you cleaned that vent that's also part of the dash and you saw how dirty that was back there yeah it's very bad all the all my film was like deteriorating like i mean it made sense because as i turn on the vent you just smell it in my car yeah yeah or so in personally in my car when the vents on high you can see literally see dust particles blow out at you and I talked to someone about it at a last first Friday was that, you know, comparing airflow, it's not a fair comparison in my car because my foam is probably all disintegrated. So like I turned it on high and the blower is like loud, but like no air is coming out because it's probably just escaping through all the deteriorated foam in the back of my dash. Yeah. I'm just like going nowhere in that pretty much. Yeah. yeah. The routing for the heater wasn't so bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the heater lines. Yeah. It's basically two 180s and then two 90s. And I got it to connect to the factory lines through the factory holes for the heater lines. So the heater stuff was not that big a challenge. Yeah, I think just, was, I think the routing for the AC lines was a little harder than that, right? Than the heater lines? Yeah, figuring yeah. out how I was going to route the AC lines. That one was a challenge because one thing that I'd like to do for the future is actually run more hard lines. But that's for the future. Right now, majority is uh, the rubber reduced barrier hose. So the thing is, like for that high side line, it's I think a, a size 10 hose, which is actually really thick. So you actually cannot run it through like the two holes in the like the radiator support wall because it's just like too tight a fit to run two of those big hoses in there. Whereas like OEM, they were uh, hard lines that were running through there. So yeah, which made it a lot easier. Yeah. So <laughs> in the future, version like two or three, when I start doing aluminum hard lines, but we're version seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
So fast forward a little bit, I guess a huge breakthrough for us was uh, the day when we finally could charge the system. Oh, yeah, that was cool. I was like, finally, like, it's because we were turning it on as it was going, right? So it's cool to feel the air get colder and colder. Yeah. Yeah, so that was like very exciting. Yeah, that's a weird, really weird sensation in a Corolla to turn the AC on and actually cold air come out of the vents. That's a very strange sensation. I'm still shocked. Like, I I still like, is this, wow, it's cold? (laughs) Like, I'm not used to it. Like, I still am not. Yeah, like, it's still just insane. Yeah, charging the system was a little bit cumbersome because we have like a loaner pair of gauges. And then we had a scale that uh, would measure the Freon because we bought like two little cans from the parts store. So I don't know. We'll see where this project ends up in the future. Hopefully it'll be successful enough that I can buy like a full-size AC machine. But uh, we'll see how that goes. So where do we see the future of the vintage air product or... What changes do you have in mind for your personal car right now? I think for me, I think I want to get the hose as direct as, like, direct as possible. So I'm thinking about taking out the dash and try to get like 3D printed like vents made. So we could just hook it up into the hoses instead of using um, like OEM. I, I like the fact that we did, but then I just this issue is like it's not blowing. I like a harder flow in my opinion, yeah. Mm. that's probably gonna be like later on probably not now or anytime soon but yeah next i have that mock-up unit on order so for you guys that don't know what i'm talking about it's the that hvac box but there's no like guts inside it's just a box so you can the purpose of that thing is to like mock it up in the dash so you know how to make the brackets but what i want to use that thing for is as a mock-up so I can make two manifolds for it. So on that Gen 2 mini unit, there's two air outlets for the defrost and then there's three for face. And I don't need five outlets. I only need two, one for defrost and one for face. So the plan is to make two manifolds that'll convert two into one and then three into one. I think that's where I want to start. And then after that, down the line, it would be cool to make some like 3D printed stuff that just hooked up to the factory HVAC boxes or HVAC vents so that we're not doing like adapter on top of adapter. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of sucks. So like Corolla stuff, it's weird. Like there are two middle, two middle vents is weirdly shaped. It's like, it's in like a weird, like, was it a parallel or him? It's not a square. Yeah. Like, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a really weird shape. Yeah. It's not a square. It's not a rectangle. Plus it's not straight because it's got like a few bends in the, in the yeah. vent too. So yeah, not so easy. I do want to talk about like sanded because they have different, they have different compressors, which I realized we, I should have looked up a little more about. Okay. So yeah. talk about the sanded compressor. Yeah. So I realized like, so Larry Chen also did a vintage air in his Datsun, his 240, and he uses a different compressor which is able to hand up to like 9k rev like rpm which i was like man if we did that been a lot easier because then you know how to run an rpm switch at that point but then we can't do that anymore is because the way it's set up it's very different it's set up in like a h or like a square and they go and two bolts go through it oh the compressor bolt pattern yeah different. it's different yeah. yeah so it's not ours where it's a on the side the other one goes like front if that makes any sense yeah a little like yeah. <laughs> anyway, the mounting's yeah, like yeah. completely yeah, different, different yeah. so we'd have to make another bracket from yeah. scratch. Yeah. yeah, so screw that. Don't yeah. worry about that. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah, thanks again, Stephen, for sticking around to podcast and we're doing this recap on the Vintage Air system. Are you active on social? Do you want to shout out your social? I am active. I just, I I, found, I got my handle back. I got a handle from 8.6. So I changed it to list, list less without the E, 8.6. So I'll probably start posting more on that instead of posting on my main or which is Steven Vivan. But yeah, if you just follow me, I'll probably start posting more. Listless.86. Or just list 86. Listless86. Yeah. Make sure to follow Steven. Keep up to date on him and his car. If you guys have any more questions about the Vintage Air system, please contact either one of us. Cool. Thanks again, man. Yeah, thanks. That's it for this week's episode. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. 
And please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, as reviews really help support us. You can do it straight from your desktop. Don't even need an Apple device. This is Auto House Z. Thanks for all the support, you guys. Thank you.